some technical difficulties, which are now <laughs> fixed. So I'll call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for invocation. Tonight, we have Moshkan Talai from the Baha'i Faith Community. Did I say that close enough? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. O thou merciful Lord, O thou who art mighty and powerful, O thou most kind Father, these servants have gathered together, turning to thee, supplicating thy threshold, desiring thy endless bounties from thy great assurance. They have no purpose save thy good pleasure. They have no intention save service to the world of humanity. O oh God, make this assemblage radiant. Make the hearts merciful. Confer the bounties of the Holy Spirit. Endow them with a power from heaven. Bless them with heavenly minds. Increase their sincerity so that they will all humbly and with contrition turn to thy kingdom and be occupied with service to the world of humanity. May each one become a radiant candle. May each one become a brilliant star. May each one become beautiful in color and redolent of fragrance in the kingdom of God. O kind Father, confer thy blessings Consider not our shortcomings. Shelter us under thy protection. Remember not our sins. Heal us with thy mercy. We are weak. Thou art mighty. We are poor. Thou art rich. We are sick. Thou art the physician. We are needy. Thou art most generous. O God, endow us with thy providence. Thou art the powerful. Thou art the giver. Thou art the beneficent. Abdul Baha. Amen. Thank you. <coughs> Can I have a roll call, please, Beth? Mayor Kavanaugh? Here. Vice Mayor DePorter? Here. Council Member Brown? Here. Council Member Magazine? Here. Council Member Hansen? Here. Council Member Yates? Present. And Council Member Lachey? Here. Okay, thank you. We want to uh, events related to economic development. Um, first, I have our report about our MAG Regional Council meeting. We were introduced to the Arizona Motorcycle Safety and Awareness Foundation, which is working with the governor's office to promote safety and awareness while riding. They offer classes and scholarships for those who can't pay. The classes are for new riders as well as older ones who have decided to get back on the road. Once again, we're still discussing the ozone boundary designations and ozone violation. Um, I have spoken about this in the past, how under the EPA Clean Air Act, we have been in violation for our dust storms. The latest issue involves a malfunctioning of one of our monitors. Had the monitor been functioning properly, based on the data from the other monitors, we would have been in compliance. Unfortunately, the EPA would not allow MAG and ADEQ to submit this additional information for consideration not even after a letter from the governor. So to kind of sum it up, one of our monitors malfunctioned. That caused us to be out of compliance. We notified EPA that we were at, they notified us we were out of compliance. We tried to submit this extenuating uh, circumstances as to why we would have been considered out of compliance. And they said we don't allow submittals for extenuating circumstances. 
So we're, we're all still shaking our heads. We, we can't understand this, but that's coming from the EPA. <laughs> um, I have a, an EGC report from um, Vice Mayor DePorter. So let him do it. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to share um, an, a micro pilot project we are doing, uh, we being uh, LinkedIn, the, the company I work for, uh, on top of this wonderful job. Uh, we're doing a micro pilot project where we're looking to recruit, train, and place into employment a cohort of 12 opportunity youth. Opportunity youth are defined currently as 17 to 24 year olds not in school. So if anyone has any of those, send, please send them, send them our way. What the program is going to do is certify these, uh, this group, this youth in uh, CompTIA, A+, and Network Plus certifications, give them 90 days of on-the-job training at local area employers, uh, with 50% of that being paid by uh, Workforce Investment Act dollars that are there for that exact thing. Uh, I mention that because we are working with some hometown uh, companies through Scott Cooper to solicit this to uh, see if there's any um, Brokers Alliance or any of our other ones that may have an IT need to bring on one of these talented, uh, talented youths. Uh, and a bit of a stretch from economic development, but, but I do believe it's related. Uh, I was, my, my son is enrolled in kindergarten here at, found at uh, Four Peaks Elementary School, and they added a fourth kindergarten teacher. And what that means for the town is the pipeline has grown of students that are going to go through our district and uh, enrich the lives of the town. So that's super duper exciting that the enrollment exceeded expectations and that teachers coming on board in the next couple of weeks. Wow, it's great news. Thank Good. You. Okay, and um, Councilman Yates, you have something on uh, yeah, economic Mayor, development. Thank you. Uh, along those same lines, earlier uh, this evening we had the grand opening of Morningstar um, over on Paul Norton. Very well attended. All the corporate folks from Morningstar came in. Um, the staff that they've already hired absolutely loves Fountain Hill, as I was able to speak to many of them. In fact, one of them, the wellness director, loved it so much that she moved her family here. So again, along the same lines as Vice Mayor DePorter, here's an example of economic development working. Um, and they were way ahead of schedule. I, I talked to uh, Bart Shea and Corky Northrup, uh, some of the developers, and they said they're ahead of their leasing schedule. So another good sign that things are going okay for for Fountain Hills and, and for them. Thank you, Mayor. Good. Good news all around. Okay. Uh, presentation of the financial audit reports, including the comprehensive annual financial report for the year ended June 30th, 2016 by Jennifer Shields, partner, and Joshua Jumper, audit manager with Heinfeld, Meach, and Company, PC. Grady? Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, um, as you're aware, each year the town undergoes a um, independent audit of the town's finances. Um, this is not only required by, by state law, but it's, um, it's one of these good, good practices that we do. Um, it's completely transparent. Um, they publish their findings basically in a comprehensive annual financial report, and they also um, submit what's called a uh, management letter that identifies any issues that they may have found during the audit. Um, I have to tell you that uh, this is the first year that we've had this firm. Um, every so often we, we uh, put this out to uh, basically out for proposal. And uh, the staff under um, our finance director's leadership uh, worked very diligently to get all the, the information that they needed as well as all the department heads because it really touched every aspect of the town financially. So. Uh, Craig, did you have any comments that you wanted to do in the introduction? So with that, we'll go ahead. Um, we have Jennifer Shields, who is a partner with uh, Heinfeld and Meach and & Company, and also uh, Joshua Jumper, who is the audit manager. So they're going to go through their, uh, their findings and share with you um, uh, any information that they feel is pertinent to you. Again, they work for you. Um, you have your fiduciary responsibility, and as part of the governance of the town, they are actually are working for you, not for the staff. So. Okay, welcome. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Miller, um, Mayor Kavanaugh, and members of the council. It's a pleasure for us to be here tonight. Um, I know that uh, oftentimes uh, reports on the financial statements and the audits are not always um, the most riveting uh, pieces of information. And uh, Mr. Miller did a great job um, via introduction 
this is our first year being here um, with the town under a new contract. So um, I'd like to, I guess, first start by thanking um, thanking you all and also thanking um, Mr. Rudolphy especially and his staff. They were absolutely fantastic and very prepared for the audit. Um, it's never an easy thing to do to switch auditors um, because you know uh, you go through a process where the auditors and the um, people being audited have to sort of learn each other's um, processes um, from scratch. So it was probably fairly exhaustive for them, and so I'd like to um, thank them for all of their you know time, effort, and energy spent in preparing. Um, jumping right straight to the chase, the financial statements. Um, so we have, you have all um, received a copy of the CAFR. Josh has a little. You guys all have a copy of that. Yes, we do. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that that is the the sort of the end product of the um, actual audit, and in there is the audit opinion. There's two pages worth of audit opinion. Though, um, happy to report that the um, opinion was what's considered unmodified, which is the best that you can do. So no material modifications to the financials that you are provided on an ongoing basis throughout the year. So we didn't have any issues there. Um, our audit standards also require us to do certain communications with governance, and so I'll just kind of run through some of those, what those are, um, let you know that we did not have any disagreements with management um, about it, accounting practices or any other types of issues like that. There were no uncorrected misstatements that were um, that resulted as a result of the audit. We had no difficulties that we encountered when performing the audit. Um, I'll alert you to the fact that there was one new accounting pronouncement that was called out in the audit opinion, um, not significant in terms of any anything that most of us would notice in terms of the financial statements, but there was a new accounting pronouncement implemented for um, accounting for your investments. At, it's called a fair value measurement. Um, so there was that. And then also, um, in terms of actual accounting estimates, there, um, the most significant estimates that are contained within the financial statements are those that are related to perhaps your um, capital assets and the depreciable lives of your assets. Um, that does result in an estimate as well as perhaps um, you know, any compensated leave if, if that's applicable or um, sometimes there are um, you know, estimates that manage may make in terms of whether our receivables are valid or not. So there are sometimes um, some estimates with respect to that. But um, by and large, capital assets are the largest estimate within the financial statements. Um, also, you did receive copies of additional reports that are related to the audit itself, um, one of those being the expenditure limitation report. So under state statute, the town has to operate within certain expenditure limitations. And so that report is also included in your packets and you are still well under your your limits that, that are statutorily imposed upon you. Um, Mr. Miller mentioned a management letter regarding any uh, particular um, findings that may have been noted and we did note something when we were looking at, um, I believe it was building permits. Building permits. Um, there was just one issue where we felt like, uh, you know, perhaps some procedures could be tightened up a little bit um, with respect to how the, the charges for building permits, um, how those happen on a, on a routine basis when conducting business through the town. Um, with that, um, unless you have questions for us, um, that would conclude our presentation. Any questions? Questions? Good question. Councilman Yates. Thank you very much, and we're glad to hear that. We're uh, realizing that you're kind of taking a snapshot in time. Um, did you see any trends that we should uh, consider? Um, you know, that's that's actually a difficult question, I think, for us to answer. I'd probably have to defer back to either Mr. Rudolphy or Mr. Miller. Um, in terms of trends, the, the financial statements look at certain trends um, just to make sure that, you know, anything big, you know, dips and... Um, to, you know, if there was any big raise in expenses, that, dips yeah, in revenues. I know we did like, some changes in our budget, just how we allocate um, some of our revenues, especially when we transfer them from um, different accounts that are already set up for specific projects. But aside from all that, no. Aside from you know, because you guys go through a pretty detailed process within the budget um, as you go through adopting your budget and you um, approve various transfers that are expected in funding. Um, so aside from what was already laid out within that, we did not note anything that was alarming. You know, certainly I think development, as you guys are going to continue talking about tonight, 
continues to be a focus of not just Fountain Hills, but the state as a whole. So I think that's you know something that's always at the forefront of everyone's mind. Madam Mayor, lastly, maybe just a general gap question. Being a nonprofit, where are we on the cycle as far as depreciable assets? Uh, this building, for example, are we allowed to re, re up that? Um, in terms of it's yeah, it's a. You follow me. You're showing our value, but we're showing, obviously we're this showing building. the values. Yes, um, you know, there's not a provision within governmental accounting that allows for us to say write up our land, write down our buildings, et cetera, because of you know appraisals. Um, so we we can't do that. What we really have to do is show the cost of an asset, um, and then um, through the estimation process, you know, if if the the building was say 50 years. If we decide later that 50 years was a perhaps poor estimate, we change that on a go-forward basis. But let's say you have land that appreciates in value, we don't have a mechanism where we get to write that up for financial statement purposes. It would only get written up in terms of creating a revenue source should you sell a parcel of land or something like that. That's when it would be recognized. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mary. Anything else? Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, come on, that was exciting, right? <laughs> you made it as exciting as possible. Yeah. We appreciate that. And you make a wonderful report. It's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> That's why there were no questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we'll go on to our quarterly budget report presented by our finance director for the first quarter year ending September 2016. Brady? Uh, thank you. I have no comments. Um, Mr. Rudolphi, our finance director, will go ahead and go through his uh, quarterly budget presentation. Mayor, council members, happy to be here tonight on this wonderful rainy evening. Um, as I go through this report, um, please bear in mind that it is a look at the current year budget, how we are tracking compared to what we endeavored to do when we established the budget in May, June timeframe. So it's going to be divided into two portions. Um, the first part is going to be looking how we are doing for the three months. Um, I'll say again that our accounting system for budgeting purposes has the ability, but we don't have the staff time to adequately allocate revenues and expenses appropriately throughout the year. So the accounting system takes the provision of we're going to take one twelfth each month. So as we know, some of our seasons are more revenue generating and or more expense generating than others. But as far as the accounting is concerned for it, it's sort of like on a straight line, three months out of the 12 um, moving forward. So this is our revenues for the three months ending, total of 4.6 million. Um, our general fund is our operating fund, which is by far the largest one, representing 73% of our totals. Want to explain again that even though we have a general fund, I'm typically referring to the operating fund, which is a combination of the general fund, our public art fund, an internal service fund, and our equipment replacement fund. This is just now talking about our operating funds. Operating funds was 3.3 million of the total 4.6. Um, as you can see, or if you can add up the, the numbers, 88% um, of our operating fund comes from local sales tax and state, state shared revenues. Um, and unfortunately, and I'm hoping this is just because of the way the accounting system allocates the revenues, we're at 94% of our projected revenues. A little bit finer detail of what our operating funds look like. Um, state shared revenues are at 97%. Uh, local sales tax, unfortunately, is at not only 92%. Um, and then we have our other miscellaneous revenues for the operating fund. Another look at state shared revenues. I'm not sure why the state sales tax is below budget. Um, typically, we are able to do a pretty good job on that. Um, state shared revenues represent 83, I'm sorry, 
of our total monies. Before I get into our local sales tax, I want to point out that on June 1st of this year, the Department of Revenue changed the reporting for transaction privilege tax. They are now requiring businesses, entities to report by business code and business location. Um, as a result of that, the reports that we're getting now from DOR are not comparable to prior periods. So the first time that DOR started requiring business codes was in starting January 1st, but the first report, I'm sorry, starting January 1st, 2015, but the first report came in for the month of February 2015. So I was able to go back and restate numbers for sales tax to try to be comparable from 15 to 16. But as we go back prior to February 15th, I do not have comparable numbers. So if some of these graphs look unusually different for showing an increase or decrease, that very well could be due to the reporting that I'm not able to reconstruct. Okay. So here's our first local sales tax, 53% of operating budget. It is an increase in total of 5% over the prior year, but we are only at 87% of the operating funds <coughs> projected budgeted sales tax. Broken down by um, categories. I'm sorry, Craig, question. before you get too far, that's 87% of the annual budget, not, or is it 87% at this time? It's 80%, 7% at this time. Okay. We'd be way ahead if it was 80% of the annual. Just wanted to clarify. Yes. Thank you. And once again, all I did is took the annual divided by four and compared the total this year to that total. Okay. Retail. Um, <coughs> A little slight decrease from prior year and a little slight decrease from budget also or from our projections. Restaurant revenue, this is the one category that I noticed that got me interested in trying to restate prior numbers but I haven't been able to. Um, so I'm not really sure that we, while we're showing an increase that that is a really representative increase for the first quarter of this year. Telecommunications, you can see that big spike in 13-14. I'm sure that's due to reporting issues, not being able to come up with a comparable number. So if that would come down in line, I'm not sure where it would be allocated. Some of it could have gone back to restaurant bars or um, retail. One we're interested in is construction sales tax. Under budget, um, well, not, not meeting budget as well as not meeting last year's number and down from 1415. Uh, a lot of that could be due just to timing of when the construction projects were um, permitted and construction began. Moving on to, rev to expenditures, the chart's even harder to read. Um, we, uh, total expenditures for the quarter are three and a half million, um, up from prior year by 8%, but still under budget. Going in and looking at some of the other funds, the main one is our Highway User Revenue Fund. Um, once again, under budget, totaling only 700000 so far. Increase from the prior year, um, primarily consisting of um, VLT and HERF revenues. HERF expenditures are really small, only $200,000. Um, the reason for that is because our annual payment management didn't really happen until September, and we just paid in our last check run the um, construction company for that work. So in the next quarter, we'll see a significant increase in the total as well as the percentage devoted to the pavement management. Here's how our other funds look. Um, these are the restricted funds, development fees, special revenue, uh, excise tax, debt service, and our capital projects. Finally, we have our fund balances. Um, 
some of the numbers to point out capital projects we only have 7.2 million dollars of capital projects money um, and only a million dollars in our excise tax fund which is economic development and downtown strategy our development fees total the 2.26 um, essentially the majority of it is committed to either Adaro Canyon or, and or the new fire station so until those projects move forward that balance will remain the same in summary I just want to report again or comment that we're only comparing actual to budget for the current year it's not a representation of future trends operating revenues are 14 percent under budget and but three and a half percent higher than last year that's a good thing unfortunately it's offset by the operating expenditures they're under budget but they're also higher than last year pavement management remains a priority in my opinion the fund balances are acceptable for all of the funds and our local indicators are remaining stable now we're going to change our focus a little bit and I'm going to kind of talk about annual trends and the year as a whole moving forward so this is the chart that we prepared when we adopted our budget it shows quite well that our anticipated revenues are going to fall short of our anticipated expenditures the number that we had used is 5.9 million looking just at revenues here's the trending of our revenues they appear to be rising rather nicely however if we go to the next slide and our year-to-date expenditures you can see that they are also rising nicely it's a little bit hard to see but the two graphs on the right side are fire and emergency medical and law enforcement and you can definitely see the trend upward on those um, administration is pretty much flat and the other ones um, you can see there this might be a little bit better indication graphically of historically our revenues versus our expenditures the blue line is our revenues and the orange or brown or red line is our expenditures um, as you can see every year revenues have fallen below expenditures and while we can continue for some time right now we're living off of the surpluses that were developed pre great depression time great recession time with that i'm happy to answer any questions mm -hmm. questions questions madam mayor uh councilman yates um without going into the fire and and um law enforcement with regard to community services um, why do you anticipate additional expenses there are we adding staff are we adding programs or We're adding programs and we have grant expenditures included in those numbers so the grants that we're getting from Fort McDowell and Salt River are increasing the available funds for community services but that would be a pass-through I mean the grant amount coming in is just going out but we're just showing it graphically correct okay okay thank you yeah. councilman magazine uh, Craig this may not be a question you can really answer but I'll ask it anyway if you straight line our budget through next year through the next budget given what you know um, what would be the difference roughly between uh, revenue and expenditures in other words 5.9 million is the uh, was in in the budget 5.9 million over the next five years was considered the shortfall any sense as to what it would be in another year if you straight line the budget another year farther out or next fiscal year next fiscal I think year. is what he's talking about uh, the projections that we had in the budget were for about a five hundred thousand dollar shortfall for what period for fiscal 17-18 so we'll July 1st so it would be added to no I have not done any projections based on what other than what I had done for preparation of the budget okay that's what I thought okay thanks any other questions thank you Craig thank you okay. any speaker cards 
No beer. Congratulations on such a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, consent agenda. We have six items. Now you have motion. So moved. Mayor second. second. Okay, and roll call, please. Vice Mayor DePorter. Aye. Councilmember Magazine. Aye. Councilmember Leger. Aye. Councilmember Hansen. Aye. Councilmember Yates. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Mayor Kavanaugh. Aye. Mayor 7-0. Thank you. Uh, regular agenda item number seven, consideration of appointing four citizens to serve on the Strategic Planning Advisory Commission for a two-year term beginning on November 6, 2016 and ending on November 5, 2018. Uh, just a reminder, our Strategic Planning Advisory Commission is um, made up of all volunteers and they give quite a bit of their time uh, to the commission and some of them are asking to re-up again and we thank them for their past service and also for continuing to serve the town. I move to appoint Tammy Bell, Gerard Bazelia, Peter Bordeaux and John Kraft to serve a two-year term on the Strategic Planning Advisory Commission beginning November 6, 2016 and ending November 5, 2018. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Any council discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Mayor 7-0. Okay. And I see John is here. John Croft. You here? That's, I'm sorry, that's Bernie. Yeah. Okay. I thought I saw John here earlier. No. I think I saw him as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, congratulations to all of them. And again, thank you for um, donating so much of your time to the town. Uh, we'll go into uh, item number 8 and 10. We'll have one staff report, consideration of resolution 2016-28, declaring as a public record that certain document filed with the town clerk and entitled the November 3rd, 2016 zoning ordinance amendments related to site plan approval. Grady. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, we'll go ahead and have Mr. Rogers, our development services director, go ahead and give a report. You want the report now or at the public hearing? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we should probably be going to the public hearing first. Oh, do you want to give? He can give his report right. first. This is uh, this is a public hearing. This is Ordinance 1611. It's a series of amendments to 16 separate sections of seven different chapters of the zoning ordinance. All the amended sections relate to new commercial, industrial, multifamily, and/or mixed-use proposed projects. This ordinance will reorganize, consolidate, and/or eliminate sections related to application submittal and approval requirements for concept plans, site plans, special use permits, PUDs, PADs, and rezonings. Each of these sections have similar submittal requirements, but each is also slightly different from the others. Ordinance 1611 consolidates these into one list of submittal requirements and puts it in one location in the ordinance, and applicants will no longer have to look through multiple ordinance sections in order to figure out what they have to submit when they want to propose a new project. Quick outline of the changes. Chapter two, procedures, will be amended by eliminating the concept plan section, the plan review section, and the PUD section, and replacing them with the new site plan review section. This is the meat of the proposed ordinance amendments. This new section outlines the submittal requirements and also the requirements for administrative review and approval, and it fixes a number of minor housekeeping items such as updating the department's name, fixing typos, and other minor details. Chapter 12, Commercial Districts, is being amended to refer the relevant applications to those new Chapter 2 regulations. Chapter 13, Industrial Districts, is being amended by eliminating two sections that are no longer relevant. Chapter 17, Wireless Towers and Antennas, is amended with minor changes to reference site plans rather than plans of development. Chapter 18, the TCCD district is amended to change the references from concept plan approval to site plan approval. Chapter 19, architectural review is also amended to change the references from concept plan approval to site plan approval. 
and chapter 23 PADs <clears throat> being amended to change the references from concept plan and development plan to site plan. The submittal requirement section is being eliminated and applicants are pointed back to the new chapter two regulations. The site plan review and approval procedures are also being amended and consolidated. Ordinance 1611 amends the process of approval of these proposals so that if the submittal require, meets all the requirements of the ordinance and no special use permits or variances or rezonings or waivers are necessary, there's no need to go to a public hearing process currently used under the concept plan process. Staff will now be authorized to approve site plan proposal administratively and the applicant may move straight to applying for their building permits. If a special use permit variance, rezoning, or waiver is requested as part of the application, then the public hearing process with P&Z and Council that's currently in effect for those types of applications will still be necessary for approval. Also note that should an applicant be denied administrative approval of their site plan, or even if they disagree with one or more stipulations of an approval, there will now be a two-step appeal process included that allows the first appeal to go to P&Z, and if they're not satisfied there, they can appeal P&Z's decision to the Council for a final answer. In summary, Ordinance 1611, administrative site plan approval will consolidate multiple ordinance sections, streamline the new site plan review and approval process, and it will allow for administrative staff approval when all ordinance provisions are being met. It will not change the public hearing process for applications that require special use permits, variances, rezonings, or waivers. It creates a two-part appeal process should an applicant be dissatisfied with the denial or the stipulations of an approval and it performs a much needed cleanup of a number of minor ordinance sections, making at least those portions of the ordinance more easily understood. Planning and Zoning Commission forwarded a recommendation to Council to approve Ordinance 1611 as presented. The staff also recommends approval. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. Any questions for Bob? Do we ask during this section or? Yeah, you can ask questions. Um, Matt, yes. <laughs> Bob, good job. Thank you very much. And thank you, staff. I know this was something you've got, been working on for a while. Um, I had brought up some uh, different scenarios, specifically with regard to us requiring um, the specific number of parking units or specific square foot usage. For example, if you're building a retail building and you're not sure how many restaurants might play out or if it's all going to be an office, depending how the market takes you, not that too many people are building on spec, but can you walk me through this scenario? Because my concern, at least when I read, especially the sections on parking, it seemed like you're talking about just, you have to designate off street parking, but with regard to a finite number um, during the site plan review. Currently in, in a review like that, you would have to actually identify all the current spaces on site. On site as well. Correct. Uh, under this regulation, it would still be the same parking requirements as, as previously. Um, if you're considering something like building on spec where you're not sure what's going in, then you'd have to at least, at least stipulate that you're going to meet the regulation when you go to building permit. But, Madam Mayor, if I may, but under this, under our new system, the site plan review, we're just kind of going after conceptually, here's what we're going to do. We're not sure what the tenants are, but based on building a 20,000 square foot building, we're going to have 100 parking spots and, and then adjust accordingly. We could probably work with something like that. 99.9% .9 of, the, of the development proposals won't come in that way, but okay, it's, it's something we could probably tell. We do have other times where they will stipulate that they're going to meet the ordinance for parking or signage or whatever else uh, when they go to building permit. Okay, but again, Madam Mayor, if I may, um, you feel strong enough that there's a little bit more leeway as opposed to a definitive number because this seems to be some of the bottleneck things when some projects come in, when some projects, and even on a smaller scale, they don't know how many spots they're going to be or how many they're going to need until the project's finished. You feel strong enough that based on this, we can work through this to get over that hump? We could work through stipulations to allow for something like that. It's a, but if they do propose something, then they don't have enough parking, then we would have to also have the ability not to allow it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Any other questions for Bob? <clears throat> okay. Do we have any speaker cards? No, Mayor, not on this item, number eight. Okay. Then um, I need a motion on this one. Um, it's, it's not a... Not a public hearing, not this one. Mayor, the first item is to declare it a public record. So we need 
A motion on that. A motion. Yeah. So I need a motion. Close the public hearing. Go ahead, Jen. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not public. It's hearing. not a public hearing. So the first moved. item is just. I just, I just need a motion. So moved as presented. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mayor seven zero. Okay. All right, um, now we go on to 9 and 10, and I will remind everyone that speaker cards for 9 and 10 will be called during the public hearing of number 9. Now I will open the public hearing regarding Ordinance 16-11, amending the Fountain Hill Zoning Ordinance, Chapters 2, Procedures, 12, Commercial Zoning Districts, 13, Industrial Zoning Districts, 17, Wireless Communications Towers and Antennas, 18 Town Center Commercial Zoning District, 19 Architectural Review Guidelines, and 23 Planned Area Development District by adopting by reference that certain document known as the November 3rd, 2016 Zoning Ordinance Amendments relating to administrative site plan approval. Uh, Council, any further questions or comments? Yes, Vice Mayor. I just, I just want to say I, I heard four key words a lot in what you just said, and consolidate, streamline, clean up, and easier to understand. So I thank you for all the staff yeah. work in doing that, because those are all really important things that, to clear up any, any uh, unclear areas. So thank you for that. OK. And do we have any speaker cards on this item? Because this no, will be the only one between 9 and 10 that we'll be taking. Public hearing, public comment, no? No speakers. Okay. Um, and I'll close the public hearing. Consideration of Ordinance 16-11 is just presented. Any further council discussion? If not, I'll request a motion. So Mayor. Okay. Second. Mayor, are there any? <laughs> <laughs> is that a discussion or? A... No, I've got to make a motion. Ah, okay. He got featured to it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Mayor 7 0. Okay. For items 11 and 13, there'll be one staff report. Consideration of Resolution 2016 22, declaring as a public record that certain document filed with the town clerk and entitled Town of Fountain Hill Zoning Ordinance Amendments Related to Outdoor Lighting, November 3rd, 2016. Brady and or Bob? Yeah, I'll just go ahead and have our Development Services Director continue with his report on, on this particular subject. Thank you. Originally proposed by staff in order to update the town's outdoor lighting ordinance, which is chapter eight of the zoning ordinance, to bring it up to today's standards, ordinance 1603 ballooned into a full rewrite of chapter eight, along with amendments to chapter one, definitions, and chapter six, signs. In order to take into account the CFL and LED light equivalents to the standard in incandescent bulbs that are called out in the current ordinance, we needed to revise the whole ordinance and change the methodology of testing and of the enforcement of outdoor lighting in a uniform manner, regardless of the type of light fixtures being looked at. Staff received a lot of information and support from the Dark Sky Group during this process. The group has been very influential regarding some sections of the revised ordinance you have before you tonight. Some of the highlights of this ordinance are references to watts were changed to their equivalence in lumens. Definitions have been updated. The shielding requirements have been modified. The correlated color temperature of lights has been set at a maximum of 3,000 Kelvin. It prohibits light trespass onto adjoining properties. It modifies the sign code as it relates to the electronic and LED illuminated signage. It provides for some exemptions for municipal uses, emergencies, holidays, lighting, uh, holiday lighting and special events, and a non-residential lumen density cap, which limits the amount of lumens per net acre, has been included in the lighting plan, submittal requirements for new commercial construction proposals. The Planning and Zoning Commission has forwarded a recommendation to approve the outdoor lighting ordinance that you have before you. Staff also recommends that Council approve that ordinance as presented. However, the Dark Sky Group has requested that certain additional provisions be be, uh, be provisions relating to municipal lighting also be included in the ordinance. The Dark Sky Group proposes that town lighting should be required to comply with the requirements of the outdoor lighting ordinance and the town include an additional new section that deals with municipal lighting. Their proposal would require new retrofitted or replaced outdoor town-owned town lights to meet the 
the requirements of this ordinance. Included as part of this proposal is to also then remove the town lights from the list of exemptions in section 804B. I believe the other government and en en entities uh, as exemptions. Also, it has been presented to staff that this language is a necessary component in order for the town to be awarded dark sky certification. Both PNZ and staff uh, did not support this request. Uh, and uh, so the request was for the ordinance you have in front of you. And that concludes my presentation. So which, which exactly uh, did PNZ recommend? PNZ recommended the ordinance proposal as you have it, not amended. The amendment uh, PNZ and staff did not support. And the amendment included the? The amendment is for the uh, town municipal lights to be included. Okay, and the density cap? The density cap was moved to the uh, application procedures. Okay, and did the PNZ discuss that? Yes, at length. And was that, was that a yes? What was their discussion on that? Is that because I noticed we have we have we have nine of them listed here, which is a brief outline of the revised ordinance. But then we have the separate sections about uh, lumen density caps and municipal owned lighting. So right. were those included in the recommendation from PNZ or just these nine? The I'm not sure which nine. I have to pull out the ordinance. But you're saying the lumen density cap wasn't part of that? That's what I'm asking. Because it's not listed here in a brief outline of the revised ordinance includes. And those are the ones you read, adoption, conversion from watts to lumens. The last one that I read was the, the lumen density cap. Well, that's in the next section. That's additional that's discussion. Okay. It, it, was, it was recommended not to be in the, in the general ordinance, but in the requirements for new construction proposals. OK. OK. Um, questions from council? Okay, Councilman Yates. <clears throat> Just to start the discussion, I know right now that our present um, codes and ordinances are below the threshold of what Dark Sky typically requires as far as lumens. Is that correct? That is my understanding. Okay. Um, what are the, generically speaking, what are the benefits other than getting a cert certificate of being a Dark Sky town, city? I do not know. Um, I'm not a lighting expert. I'm not a... I'm not a Okay, so other than other than us saying saying it, we we get that certification, and and there may be some other opportunities, whether it be some grant funding, things of that nature. But other than other than that, because I know some of these things are very specific that you have to meet certain requirement to get that designation. If for some reason we don't meet all those requirements, or is it kind of an all or nothing thing? But it sounds like you're not well, really the person. My understanding is that. Either you meet the requirements for dark sky certification or you don't. Okay. There's no in, in between. Mm -hmm. And well, we'll probably talk about that other section when we come to it because that's not in this section, right? No, I think that. Is the density in section in, in yeah, this? Yeah, it's in this. It's in the discussion. ordinance as part of the uh, submittal requirements. I know, but on the agenda item because we have it split up. Is it on this agenda item? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's part of the ordinance. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, if, if you may. My, my only concern about the density. Is that when you require? I forgot what it was on on per acre. Thousand. Is it a thousand lumens? It's a thousand per acre. For the sake of discussion, let's say it's a, a thousand per acre, and you subdivide a one acre parcel into four quarter acre. So that means each each quarter acre gets 250 lumens. It is C2 zoning, but you have an office building here and a retail building here. The retail, as you know, requires more lighting than an office building, and vice versa. Um, my, my only concern with this, especially with mixed use and some of the tenants that were, or I should say businesses that we're going after, I, I, I almost, I'm, I'm really concerned about that aspect of this because um, you're going to either deter some potential retailers or force certain districts to go office because they won't accommodate what the retailers' needs are. Now, I'm not talking about mom and pops, but regional um, chains, obviously national chains, they have prototype um, businesses that require certain kind of lighting, certain type of architecture, and they're going to need more lumens than might be allocated, especially, um, you know, the way this is set up. I'm, I'm just wondering, is there some other way to do that and still keep the certification, or how else could something like that be addressed? 
That was our main concern when we were objecting to have it in the ordinance in the first place. Uh, the density cap it seemed like an additional layer of regulation, and that's why we agreed that we wouldn't we wouldn't fight against putting it into the new construction because we get a lighting plan anyway when they propose something like that. So if that were an initial requirement, the business would know what they're getting into. Um, and then we, we can look at the plan and we can make sure that they comply. But uh, after that, I'm not sure that we would have any way of doing Madam that. Madam Mayor, if, if I, um, even on new construction, and I appreciate that, but if, uh, and I use Trader Joe's as the example, they need a lot of parking and they're pretty well lit. Even under dark sky, they can accommodate their light, their lights, but they would require way more than what this would allocate for, especially a big parking lot. There, there goes all your lights. Um, how else could we work through that? Because all we're re really telling it, as soon as they come in and say, hey, we want to do this, fine, but you can't have all those lights, they're going to say, well, I'll see you later. <laughs> I'm going somewhere else. So it, it's kind of an all or nothing, correct? That is my understanding. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, and uh, just just in that same section, um, I have a little problem with having another layer of regulation, but the ability to enforce that regulation. I mean, it clearly states here that we don't have the ability to enforce it. Could you elaborate a little more on that? That was why we asked to, uh, we moved it over to the initial uh, submittal for new construction only, because then we can review a lighting plan and we can make sure that it's it's com in compliance. Mm -hmm. But after the fact, we really have we have no me mechanism. We have no, I guess, uh, equipment. So even under new construction, if it met. Um, the certification and met the standards and then you know a year later they changed things out we wouldn't really have the way to enforce that because obviously you would have to have somebody to tell you and then we have one code enforcer I mean I'm I'm concerned right now because we have one code enforcer and Roy is very very busy in which he is right now only running on complaints and so this would have to be complaint driven. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, and yet we still just have one code enforcer with a whole new layer of regulations that he's going to have to enforce. And that's why it clearly states here in um, the report from the staff, it would be an additional a redundant layer of regulation. Staff has no way of enforcing such a standard against existing properties or even later on and um, I guess the other thing I was thinking about is um, you get an existing business that changes out fixtures and things like that, then they would have to come in compliance. They should, yes. Any kind, yeah, of, any kind of retrofitting or expansion of the business or remodeling. So, and then you'd also have a situation where, let's say you've got a lot, there's some lots, uh, on the avenue. So you have a lot there and somebody builds a building there and that building has to be in compliance but the, the one next to it doesn't have to be in compliance so this building is lit differently than this building. So now we have different, a different situation for what year something was built. You understand what I'm saying? Well, you're talking about having pre-existing lighting grandfathered mm -hmm. in, yeah. Yeah. Councilwoman Hansen? Can I just speak to Cecil's example, just to see? So you say, just your example was Trader Joe's, right? And the amount of lighting they would need. Would they need more lighting than like a Target that we know is already in compliant done since from the Dark Sky Committee, the audit that they did? Yeah. Well, that, I don't know the answer to that question specifically other than every retail or any business for that matter has their own unique architectural features or um, just the way they do business, whether it be storefronts or double hung windows. And all those types of changes have varying degrees of light requirement. Um, if, depending what, like a movie theater, for example, just by code, you need a huge parking lot. Well, that parking lot's going to take a lot of your lumen requirement. In Fountain Hills, how would that apply? I, I know, but I'm just trying to use an example that kind of makes sense. Um, my, my concern here, straight scale, depending what that threshold is, of per acre um, lighting allowed is that you are now dictating that certain retailers that might have that kind of package are going to be locked out are going to be like well I can't I can't do that my prototype is XYZ and you're only giving me X. <clears throat> no, I, I just think we're kind of going since this 
that the committee did this audit and everything in town is in compliance right now, I just don't quite see a scenario where we're realistically, I'm, I think we're anticipating something that would probably never happen in Fountain Hills. Well, again, this is why we have discussions is saying that, okay, here's a threshold. If, if that's an all or nothing, this is a concern I have over capping how much, how much lighting. Um, I'm glad you do bring up Target. Although it meets the requirement and they, they did do that, in my personal opinion and, and some of the folks I run with, they feel that parking lot's too dark or that's, that um, unless there's, there's several hundred cars there, it, it doesn't seem like it's, it's very busy or things are going on. But that's, you know, neither here nor there. Whereas uh, um, does um, tractor supply comply? Yes. Complies with our current ordinance, yes. That does comply. See, in, in my opinion, that seems a little bit more alive, even though it only may only have a half dozen to a dozen cars. So, <clears throat> I like anyway, that. I'm comfortable in the parking lot. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess the only business that I can think of that might need something which is brighter are the car dealerships on um, on Saguaro, because that one that's on the corner of uh, Saguaro and Colony, that one's really bright because they have to be concerned about the security. So was that ever tested to see if they were in compliance? They installed those lights probably a, maybe less than a year ago or maybe around a year ago and those mm -hmm. were in compliance at the time. At the time. With, with the current ordinance. I'm with not the sure current how one. they fall under the new ordinance. Okay. Yeah. Councilman Magazine. Um, I keep hearing the term bright. Um, I think we have to define our terms. Um, Something may look bright to one person, not bright to another. The real question is, um, would it be in violation of what uh, is in the ordinance and what Dark Skies uh, recommends in order to get certification? Um, I haven't seen much that's any brighter than, what you mention, the um, tractor, supply. tractor supply. I mean, and my understanding is that the tractor supply lights could be quite a bit brighter and still be in compliance. And so when we talk about bright, bright is relative, a relative term. I think the car dealerships, I think, are brighter, in my opinion. And that's just the way I see bright, because it's probably because it's a smaller lot and it, you know, tractor supply is a bigger lot, so the light kind of dissipates a little bit. But you know, they, the um, car sales place always look really bright, and where they're selling the campers, and I, that's I, mostly for security. Yeah, I, Mayor, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. I mean, when I you know, go to Surprise, you know, the whole string of auto dealerships, sure. but I don't know how you define bright for those as re related to either the ordinance or dark skies. They may uh, be well within the uh, parameters established by dark skies and the ordinance. It may be that they could even be brighter and not mm -hmm. be a problem. So it, it, I just think it's hard to just generalize about brightness. Okay. Well, you know, I'm, I'm all for updating things as far as technology goes, and I'm sure that, you know, some of these changes that are um, watts to lumens and um, some of these other changes just bringing us pretty much up to date in technology is probably a really good idea because anytime you you know use better technology you're also saving money the only thing i really have a problem in is the density cap um, for a couple of the issues that councilman yates brought up but also this issue of how many per acre and talking about subdividing and which stores uh, use up the amount of density on that lot. So um, as far as some of these other issues, I don't have a problem with that, but that's, that's the one issue that, um, that's bothering me. And also the fact that if we do that, I don't like to make a law that we can't enforce, and we're already saying we can't enforce it. Mayor, might I suggest that we Go ahead and declare this as a public record so we could get into the public hearing and maybe hear what other people have to say. I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, as soon as uh, we're done and if there's any more questions, I want to give everybody a chance to, we could have. Um, but this is about declaring it a public record. Well, right now we can have speaker cards. This is not, we're not into the public hearing of number 12. We're still on 11. Am I still on? Yeah, I'm still on 11. So we can 
This Mayor, is... I have no speaker cards on number 11. Okay, have no speaker cards, but we could. This is not, this is not the public hearing until we get to um, 12. So at this point, I'll just see if any of the other council have any other, any other discussion. If not, then um, <coughs> we need a motion for this one. And this Mayor, is, is this. Mayor, I move to approve resolution 2016-22, declaring as a public record that certain document filed with the town clerk and entitled the Town of Fountain Hills Zoning Ordinance Amendments relating to outdoor lighting November 3, 2016. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor or do we need a roll call vote? Madam Mayor, quick question. But again, this one is proposed as the one that P&Z is submitting. We're only declaring it a public record. Yes, what you're making a public record. Thank you. Okay. Then all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Mayor 7-0. Okay, now we're going into the public hearing. And speaker cards for items 12 and 13 will be called during number 12 only. I'll open the public hearing, public hearing of ordinance 16-03, amending the Fountain Hill Zoning Ordinance, chapters one, introduction, six, sign regulations, eight, outdoor lighting control, by adopting by reference that certain document known as the Town of Fountain Hill Zoning Ordinance amendments related to outdoor lighting, November 3rd, 2016. Case number Z, 2016-01. <coughs> So, any further comments from council before I ask for speaker cards? Okay, we have speaker cards for number 12. Mayor, we have seven cards. One speaker did not wish to speak, um, and she wanted to let you know she was in support of Dark Okay. Space. So, we'll start with Joe Bill, followed by Nancy Bill, then Jay Schlum. Remind everybody of three minutes. Just state yes. your name, where you live. Even though we know where you live, you got to say where you live. Absolutely. Just, just your town. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the council. Mm -hmm. My name is Joe Bill, and um, I've been a resident here for 30 years. I believe you know most of our committee members. Uh, collectively, we all have worked hard for the betterment of this community in many different ways. Uh, you know how much Jerry and Jackie Miles have done for this community, and also Jay Schlum. Uh, but some of whom you might not know as well uh, include Dr. Craig Gimble. Uh, he's the one who donated the telescopes to our library, enabling our library to win a national award. Uh, Ted Blank, who is actually, you may not know this, but he is a, an official NASA solar system ambassador. Um, and he is actually here this evening, and he is also uh, coordinating the star parties and growing the astronomy club. Uh, Bob Wilson, who helped launch the astronomy club, uh, Dr. Paul McGalligat, who is an Arizona Science Teacher of the Year, uh, who installed a small observatory on the roof of the high school uh, using grants and some of his own money. And uh, lastly, my wife Nancy and me, who have been actively involved in our community, um, beginning with, as Cassie knows well, that whopper of an issue, uh, the incorporation of this town. Our committee has come together to do one more great thing for Fountain Hills, something that would give us national attention in a very positive way. Uh, tonight, a proposed updating lighting, lighting ordinance is before you. Uh, we've worked hard on this for a year and a half. We have worked through many details with town staff, and we agree on virtually everything. Uh, perhaps only one item, um, uh, although maybe lumen density needs to be addressed yet, and I, I hope I get some questions to address some of your concerns here. Um, but uh, the other item is municipally owned lighting, and that might generate some discussion. Uh, just so you know, the language of the municipally owned lighting provision has been adopted by all the other dark sky communities, and none have had a problem with it. Uh, based on that, it is our committee's opinion uh, that the town can find a way to work with this provision as such that the town can really still install any lighting deemed necessary. And in the event you ask why the International Dark Sky Association is requiring this provision, the answer is this. Uh, it is there to show that the town is supportive of good, smart lighting practices. And by doing so, it helps set an example for the community. So with that, I uh, just want to thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I would love to be called to the podium to address some of those specific concerns, and maybe we'll talk about that later. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Nancy Bill, followed by Jay Schlum, and then Ted Blank. Good evening, Mayor Cavanaugh and council members. My name is Nancy Bill, and I'm a Fountain Hills resident. I'm chair of the Dark Sky Committee, which was formed with two goals in mind. One, to update our current lighting ordinance, and two, to help the town of Fountain Hills obtain the prestigious designation of Dark Sky Community. Since July of last year, our committee's focus has been to update our current lighting and sign ordinances to address the new detrimental lighting technologies. To assist the town staff with updating the ordinance, our committee consulted the lighting experts at the International Sky Association. They helped us determine what lighting practices should be considered to assure public safety and yet protect our health in dark skies. The updated ordinances before you are a combination of the input from our dark sky committee and the town staff who we thank for their time. I ask you to keep in mind when you're considering the ordinances that all the other dark sky communities, parks, preserves, and sanctuaries have similar ordinances. And their approved ordinances have allowed for the installation of more than adequate lighting for public safety and for school and town activities. And for what's most important for our downtown development, I'd like to emphasize that the lighting ordinance allows for more than adequate lighting for businesses. And also, there's no restriction on the hours of operation. In fact, it allows more lighting than any business already has in town. In addition, the town can install whatever lighting it deems necessary for public safety. As the governing board of Fountain Hills, I would like to ask your approval of the updated ordinances, along with the municipally owned lighting provision, which would be a noteworthy legacy, a legacy, legacy that will protect our dark skies and impact the health and well-being of our current and future citizens. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, thank you. Next, Congratulations, Cub fans. And, uh, <laughs> He's why, why, you. why are you gonna do that? <laughs> I think our town's 20% Illinois. So. No. <laughs> um, town uh, staff, council, mayor, thanks for taking this on and getting through it and working with the uh, committee made up of some really good volunteers uh, to get this completed. And I know there's been work with the um, certification group to trim back things wherever they could, so this is what they've come up with in order for us to get that. We've all known Fountain Hills has been a dark sky community since we probably lived here. Now there's a certification, and it's really because of the advent of LEDs and other bulbs that are really uh, impacting on the skies. So it's about be doing smart lighting. Um, it's not about our town getting darker, as we've heard. The lighting out there today is not so bad. It's about us using smart lighting. And we're not on the bleeding edge of this certification. There's other cool, beautiful, natural communities like Sedona and Flagstaff that already have this. So, And they're operating well, I think, in your packet, at least maybe in the past, uh, some pictures from Flagstaff businesses. If you've been up there, those are all in compliance. And there's plenty of light. There's no degradation or concern with lack of economic development up there in Flagstaff. Here in Fountain Hills, we obviously uh, value the unique uh, dark skies that we have here and be able to look at the planets and, and more up there in the sky. You don't, do, you don't get that in all parts of the valley. Our town government will always, as was mentioned, have the ability to add lighting where it's needed for safety or otherwise. Uh, some of the benefits you're asking about, obviously, if you've been walking around the fountain, you've seen the telescope set up out there. Um, there's lots of people that stop to see it. They just love it. Um, I want to thank all the committee volunteers and I encourage you guys at item number 13, the next one, is your questions to, to you brought up during item 11. I would uh, request that you bring up Joe Bill who has helped lead the committee to answer a lot of your questions or any of your concerns. I think he'd be great. And lastly, Vic Kumar, if anybody's seen him on Facebook with all of his awesome photography. He's got a hashtag, why I live here. Hashtag dark skies, and he's got some beautiful pictures where you can actually see the Milky Way here from Fountain Hills. Another unique benefit that we don't want to lose, so let's get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Ted Blank, followed by Jerry Miles, and then Amber Lee Dabrowski. Mayor and Council, thank you. 
Um, since 2014, the Fountain Hills Astronomy Club, in cooperation with the library, has offered free monthly sky watches to the community. Um, we also, as uh, Joe mentioned, uh, one of our members donated three telescopes to the library, and they were so popular, there's always a waiting list, and all you need is a library card to take one out. Um, enjoying the night sky is something everyone in town seems to enjoy, regardless of age, and everyone I've met at these events is eager to learn more about the night sky. Being a dark sky community would bring people to our town, as demonstrated by the fact that many people who sign up for our club mailing list tell me they're just visiting the town, uh, from the surrounding communities, they see the event on the library calendar and they come for the event um, and they make the trip. Uh, the, Gilbert has a public observatory under skies that are nowhere near as dark as ours and even though they're only open two nights a week, they have over 8,000 visitors a year to the public observatory. Uh, that would bring lots of people downtown or wherever it was put. Having dark skies does not mean having a dark town. Light up the downtown as needed, leave the businesses open as late as you want, just don't send light up into the sky. It's really just that simple. Um, having dark sky status would also be a selling point for new residents. There's a growing population of Americans who are looking to live a greener and more natural life, and maintaining dark skies is part of what they are looking for. Being able to offer them that amenity while continuing to improve and enhance our vibrant downtown would be a winning combination. Arizona already leads the country successfully in mixing world-class dark skies with cities and towns that have vibrant downtown areas, as you've heard about Flagstaff and Sedona. So I urge you to please approve the, the lighting ordinance with the uh, additional provisions mentioned um, on which this committee and the staff have worked so hard and so long. They will be good for the town, good for the businesses, good for its merchants, and good for its residents. Thank you. Jerry Miles, and then Amber Lee. Mayor Kavanaugh, council members, staff. I really can add nothing to what the previous speakers have done. I'm here really with the thought that my saying, Jackie and I have served with this committee and we strongly support it, might possibly bear some influence on some of you, maybe, maybe not. But in any case, I think it's a good idea and I urge you to support it. All right, thank you. Amber Lee Dabrowski. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and staff. I first want to start with that I am hopeful that we can come to a solution so that we can achieve a dark sky site. Um, sorry, dark sky certification. Part of that's because every time I drive over the hill from Scottsdale, my blood pressure goes down. The darker skies, it's beautiful. I really did move here because of darker skies. I can see the stars at night. My kids are old enough. We did a, sky, a star watch at Copper Wind over the weekend. And while you can't predict the weather, it is something noteworthy of our community. As they had mentioned, Flagstaff and Sedona are two other certified dark skies community. And Cecil, I hear your concern about any incoming prospects. I think because they've been successful at it, I feel like we can find a way to be successful at that as well. And not to pick on you, Cecil, but you also asked a question about grants and so forth. I did ask about any fi uh, financial opportunities with receiving the Dark Skies certification, and I was told that unfortunately at this time there is no financial benefit. However, I do think that it can be a marketability um, uh, value. There is a markability value for tourism. I know they're working on an observatory idea. You know, there are some things that I really think can add to the vibrant ca character of our community um, with having a dark sky certification. And with that, oh, I do want to touch upon the concern about the enforcement, which I also share. Um, I had asked about the hours of the enforcement individual, and it's during the day, so it'd be very hard to be able to see how the lights project at night. Um, so if there is a way that we can find a solution around that to make staff and council more comfortable with that, I would be in favor. That's what I've got. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Me. No. Okay. Um, did you have a question for a specific? Do, do you want, can we bring Joe Bill up to That's answer questions? That's what I was going to ask. And I was also going to. Yeah, we can to, do that. I was also going to start by, Joe, why don't you come up if you would. Uh, I, I want to start by. Uh, thanking uh, the bills and the committee and 
you know, it, it's really uh, incredible, the citizen involvement we have in this town. Um, this undertaking was no small undertaking. I know you spent an enormous amount of time, uh, you and the committee, uh, working on this, and uh, I, for one, I'm sure the council uh, appreciates it. Uh, but the question I have for you is an open-ended one, which is, uh, would you like to respond to any of the questions, issues, and so on that have been raised by council so far? Can't wait. <laughs> I look forward to it. Uh, Joe if you Bill. want, you could start with mine. Sure, I'd be happy to, Linda. Okay. Is there any way, I know that the, the biggest issue that some of the businesses are concerned about and also what Councilman Yates talked about, about the um, lumens, the, the amount per acre and all of that, okay? Is there any way that this can be done without the density cap? Well, the, the, the short answer to that is you have to have a lumen density cap because otherwise there's no limit to how many lights someone could put in. They could put in thousands of lights on a property and obviously that defeats the purpose of what we're trying to preserve here. Plus it goes beyond what is, is reasonably necessary. So I want to address this specifically because I know Cecil, you had, you had some concerns about this. Madam Mayor, um, mm -hmm. I know 100,000 lumens and I know everyone's gonna start laughing. That, that equals direct sunlight. Correct, yeah. 100,000. Right. Divided by four, I don't know what a quarter amount of, but just looking to put this in perspective, just what you need in a restaurant to, to light, like your deli area, that's like 20,000 lumens. Exterior, and it sounds like a lot, and you're like, well, gosh, you know, an acre, who can't live with, you know, direct sunlight? But can you break it down into, like, what's a CVS, what's a Walgreens, what's a let, typical let, restaurant? Go ahead. Okay, let, let me try. Uh, we've, we've done a little bit of an inventory around town. We made a lot of drives, you know, past the various um, businesses and the town facilities. Obviously, we can't know exactly what the lumen density is because to know that specifically, you'd have to find out, okay, what, what are the fixtures? How many lumens is each uh, lamp putting out, et cetera? But you can kind of eyeball it. And one of the brightest ones in town, if not the brightest, is tractor supply. And the lumen density cap allows, you probably saw it in the notes, two and a half times that which is very bright. And also in your notes, I mentioned that you probably all know what a 75 watt floodlight would be, okay? That's pretty bright, actually. And on a one acre property, you can have 90 of those lights. And that's, you know, of course, if there's a structure there besides, you can see how many lights would be allowed. It's a very, very generous density, uh, lumen density cap. But the reason there is one is because yes, it's possible for someone to go way beyond it. If they want to light something up Las Vegas style, um, this would probably stop them from doing that. So it's a very generous cap. Um, and this may be a combined question for Bob. And keep in mind, Joe, we're, we're all like the concept. These are just some, some concerns. Right. Um, a typical parking lot, um, uh, as Joe pointed out, 75 watts, 90, 90 bulbs out on one site. Granted, we, in our existing code, we have restrictions on how close that can be to the next one on the building. So that kind of takes care of an unlimited amount. It, it, all we're really talking about is what, what is that threshold? And so like a parking lot requires how many, what's the, what's the equivalent of a parking lot? Am I really putting you on the spot? Uh, or let's use tractor parking supply. Lot, parking lots have to have their lights shielded down. Right. The basic requirement is a 75 watt bulb or what are 11, 25 lumens that we read. Can be within 25 feet or has to be at least 25 feet away from the next one. Okay. Yeah, you are limited spatially by that. I think, I think that's, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, isn't, doesn't that apply to just the unshielded lighting if I'm not mistaken? Yeah. That, Joe, that, use, the, use the mic. I'm sorry. Yes, we can. Uh, just to clarify, I mean, uh, that specific provision, and Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe um, it's, it only applies to unshielded lighting, okay? And so um, it doesn't say anything about shielded or partially shielded lighting. There is nothing in the ordinance to prevent someone from putting in 10,000 partially shielded or shielded lights. The lumen density cap would. Is that correct? Mm. Oh, boy. You have to have <laughs> shielded lights. Um, right. in, in a parking lot, so you can't have an unshielded, 10,000 unshielded light bulbs. No, I'm saying, lot. but there's, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but but the, the, the ordinance would allow for as many shielded lights as you could put in because there's no limit. 
when we review the lighting plans, we require them to be 25 feet apart if they're 75 watts or more. We do, even though the ordinance may not specifically say that. Madam Mayor, as they're looking things up, for example, an open office like this, this is probably about a 100,000 100, lumens. These are bright. Well, they're blinding me. <laughs> but again, just to make it apples to apples so that we kind of understand, I mean, when you say, all right, um, 100,000 lumens, that sounds, or yeah, 100,000, that sounds like a lot because it's direct sunlight when you're comparing it to the sun, but when you say an average CVS uses X, and that's what I was wondering if you had some sort of scale that you can kind of give us. And by, by that you mean, do I know what the lumen density is at, at CVS? Well, I'm just using that as an example, but when you say 100,000 per uh, one acre site, right. it sounds like a lot, but then when you put it in, a, in I, I appreciate what you're saying that tractor supply, for all intents and purposes, I think that's more than enough light for any kind of business that could possibly be in. But when you start <laughs> breaking it down, I, that's, that's, again, only, that's my only concern. Okay, I, I'm not sure I fully understand that, but... I, I'm looking for equivalencies. Okay. If you could, uh, like, saying that, okay, this is 100,000 lumens in this room right now. Um, you know, that puts it more in perspective than just saying, well, that's more than enough. Um, that's a good question. I would think... That <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a way of measuring this. If we knew what the, what the lumen output of each of these fixtures... Uh, was we could do a calculation. That's all right. <laughs> so, but we've got a roof over it. So yeah, we don't we're need to worry about right. Going up in the sky. This so. this is fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so. And and, and so, but yeah. So just, it, it's 804, 803C that talks about the 25 foot radius thing, and and that paragraph starts with the unshielded outdoor. It specifically refers mm -hmm. to unshielded only. But I also wanted to address enforcement before I go away. Because Let me I just ask you one more question about the, I, and, then, and this probably goes to Councilman Magazine's comment before, is that everybody sees brightness differently. Now, the brightest thing that I see from my house is the lights on the football field and the lights from Four Peaks. I mean, I can see that really far. So what are those lights? Okay, first of all, those are exempted. Yeah, well, just so, just so we know, I mean, that's really bright. So what would that be? Do, do you have any I, idea? See, I, I wouldn't know exactly. Yes, they're bright. They need to yeah. be for the athletic fields. Right. And, and so maybe that is about at the cap because the cap is pretty bright, but it might even be beyond it, but it doesn't, it doesn't apply because it's exempted. It's a recreational facility or athletic facility or a special town event. They all have, you so know. So schools, schools are exempt. Yeah, for their ball fields okay. and things like that. Ball fields. Tennis courts. Parks. Yep. Okay. As long as they have adaptive control, so they aren't on all night long. Okay, and let's say Copper Wind. They've got all of their tennis courts lit. They've got... Mm -hmm. is, is, that's, that's not public property. That's private. Is as that... long as they're in use, it's okay. As long as they don't just turn them on every night and just leave them on all night, every night. So if they're having this big tennis tournament and they've got all these courts lit during that, then that's fine. That's absolutely fine. We, in fact, encourage that. Um, okay. So, um, and then the, if I could address uh, the enforcement question you had, sure. if that's okay. Um, Sedona has the same, and Flagstaff have the same issue, okay? It's very difficult to enforce any kind of retrofitting that goes on, mm -hmm. okay? So guess what? They don't. They don't enforce it. What they do is they follow the requirement of the International Dark Sky Association is that you have to educate the community. Every year, we would have to show IDA, that's the International Dark Sky Association, we'd have to show IDA all the presentations we've done during the year, all the different things we've done to educate the community about good, smart lighting practices. Mm -hmm. That's how it's enforced, just by kind of educating people. So it's not something we'd ask any co code enforcement person to do. All we did was limit it to, um, as uh, Bob mentioned, for new, new site plan submittals, because then with the photometric plan submitted, you can look at it and see what the lumen density is. So do they ever send anybody out to check on maybe originally, or do they just believe what you put down in, in applying for the certification? Oh, yeah, Nancy seems to know all the <laughs> answers to this question. And I do whatever she says. <laughs> um, that's very smart. Yes, but she did just remind me, just so you know, it's another point. Everything that's here now is grandfathered in. 
So we don't have to go backwards on anything, okay? Right. Um, but getting back to the, the retrofitting, um, it's, if, if somebody went way out of bounds, there would probably be complaints. Mm -hmm. And if there are a sufficient number of complaints, then maybe that person would have to be talked to. But it's not like we send people out looking for <laughs> violations. That's No, but do they? I mean, I, I guess I, maybe I wasn't quite clear. When you, when you want to get your certification and you put in, I mean, I don't know how you do this, but you, you put in the application and you write how you meet all the qualifications. Right. Do they actually come here to verify that or do they just go by what you? They go by what we submit. <laughs> yeah. They go, yeah, thank you. <laughs> they go by what we submit in the application. And um, okay. we would just, uh, I think, and again, just so you know, we're trying to keep, uh, when we talked to many of you way at the beginning of this whole project, we said there are two parts to this whole thing. The first part is the ordinance. And then the second part is if we get the ordinance approved as needed, then we would work to pursue dark sky designation. That's a different process. And that for that process, we would come back to the town, come back to you, and explain in much more detail what, this, what steps are needed. But I can tell you right now, we want to do this without costing the town any money. The committee wants to do the work. If there's money needed, we want to do some fundraising. And um, so that's, but that's part two. And we would, we would explain all the details uh, at that time, although we kind of know some of the details now. Okay, well, thanks. You've, you've cleared up a lot of questions. Are there more questions? Mayor, if, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, thank you, uh, and Nancy, and all of the, the committee members. I know you guys have been work, and, and women, guys meaning everybody. Um, expression you've got you, you've done a great job with it and um, you know this can get incredibly complicated and, and it, I think it has I think it's become more complicated than it needs to be if you've lived in this town long enough you've seen new buildings you've seen car dealerships you've seen Target you've seen tractor supply and from my education um, all of those fit the parameters of the parameters in the in the revised ordinance, um, and it's my, also my understanding that you could even go up higher in that regard. Okay. Now, just kind of cutting to the chase, um, following this and talking to you folks, talking to staff, it appears to me as we've moved through this process, there have been two roadblocks. There have been two impediments, one with respect to lumen density, and, it, and the other one is with respect to exemption so just specifically just to cut to the chase it seems like those are our roadblocks mm -hmm. once again clarify how you're proposing that we deal with those two roadblocks so it's perfectly clear okay first lumen density caps that was a roadblock at first because what we did is we put it in the ordinance okay and um, we worked a lot with with Bob uh, there were some concerns justifiable concerns we went back and forth on that issue, back and forth with the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, as Bob let us know early on, it's much more enforceable if you have that in the new construction ordinance or whatever. And uh, so the International Dark Sky Association agreed that that would be satisfactory. So that was the compromise we reached on that particular issue. And I believe um, the, the uh, I think I believe Andrew suggested instead of actually putting it in the um, new construction ordinance to just put it in the lighting ordinance, but specify that as for uh, new site plan, new new construction. If I'm correct, is that right? Um, it's actually covered in the site plan provisions and not specifically called out in the lighting in the provisions. ordinance. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, so that, but bottom line is we reached Sorry. a compromise. I'm, we reached a compromise that I think, I think satisfied all the parties involved. I believe. Okay. So okay. that's that's that one. <laughs> I hope. And 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 then the second one, uh, you're right. The the amendment that you have before you about municipally owned lighting, um, that as I may have mentioned is a requirement of Ida, because it does show that the town is committed to s smart lighting practices and the town sets the example. Yet. Um, our interpretation is 
um, and the interpretation of the other dark sky communities is that it really doesn't stop the town from putting in any lighting it deems necessary for safety or otherwise. So, um, and I believe, um, well, unfortunately, Jerry is gone, but when he reviewed it, uh, wearing his attorney hat, he said, I don't think this stops the town from doing whatever it deems necessary. So with that, we sort of said, okay, that's, that's where we stand on it. Can I ask you just one more question? Then sure. going back to the, you said the old business is everything that right now is grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, is there a point, I, I know when we talk about remodeling and things like that, we have ordinances that at some point you have to, you know, you have to follow other regulations depending on how much of the remodel there is and whether then you're going to need sprinklers and you get into that. So if you have an old business, okay, and then you, you put in new fixtures or you remodel or you expand, at what point would you need then to comply or because you're already an existing business, are you always... Right. That, you know, I, you understand what I'm I, saying. I do, and and yeah. I think I think the answer is, and Bob can help me here. But I think if you're just changing a few fixtures, that's that's not an issue. Mm -hmm. I think there's a point where if you do a major remodeling and you have to resubmit a plan, uh, Bob, maybe. Can Bob, you? is there a point where people would know that I have a, I have a business, I'm grandfathered in, but if I do such and such, then I have to comply. I don't know that there's a threshold in this ordinance. So I think if you do a retrofit of a night, you're putting in new lights, you're going to have to meet the ordinance, at least for those lights that you're retrofitting. Okay. Um, Council Magazine. Uh, I'd like to put a motion on the floor. Okay. Can, we can discuss I just, it. just wanted to clarify that one point. Oh, okay. Right. We're still in the Is there any team. way? Yeah, we're still in the... Is there any way we can just clarify that one point? Because that's kind of the last, because you know our, our concern is always the business community, and we're going to have to explain to them how this is going to work for them. And I know I, I talked to Scott today from the chamber, and you know they're going to have some discussion on it, so I'm sure they're going to have a lot of questions. Nancy, you could come up. <laughs> Nancy. <laughs> Nancy. You, <laughs> telling me what to say. We've all been there, brother. Yeah. <laughs> um, what uh, Nancy just shared with me is that John Barentine, who is a program director for IDA, said that it, it comes into play when a permit is involved. So if a, if a permit is involved, okay. then it has to uh, fall into compliance. But if it doesn't require a permit, then it doesn't. Okay. I don't know if that helps. Okay. One more question, yes. if you don't mind. What about the HOAs and let's say um, the town passes like a dark skies and how does that HOA fit in if the HOA, who, because I know HOAs can override some things. Can, can an HOA in, let's say, do you know how that works in Sedona or some of these other um, dark skies communities? Are you talking residential or commercial? Owners Association. Well, some of them are both because, like, for instance, the Fry's is under an HOA, the Fry Center, mm -hmm. even though it's commercial. All Plot 208 is. And Plot 208 is Association. also under an HOA. So how's that? Do we know how that well, works? Well, you know, and I'm not sure I'm the best to answer that. I guess I was just wondering if. I would say. Madam Mayor, well, Bill, well, Bill, least, Bill, why don't you go sit down? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, that's okay. Andrew, can you answer yeah, Andrew, that question? Association. What? What would? Um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, as you know, the private contract people enter into when they buy a piece of property and join a homeowners association or property owners association is not the town's fight ever. Um, sometimes their restrictions are more restrictive than towns, sometimes less, uh, but the two are independent. Mm -hmm. So one approval will mean nothing to the other, generally, unless they happen to have parallel provisions. Mm -hmm. So how would that affect our, if you got certification, but an HOA said, you know, I'm not going to comply with this area, 
I, I'm just trying to cover all these bases and these questions. I'm sorry, I have so many questions. We still have to comply with the town's regulations. I would much rather get the answers to all of this. They, they still have to comply with the town's regulations. They just may have different or stricter requirements of their own. Okay. So the towns will be the baseline for sure. That's the answer. I'm Typically what for. I tell people is they have to comply with both. That's, uh, they would have to comply with both. The but town the town area. supersedes. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's had, my answer. I had a question. I'm not sure that I agree with what Mr. Barentine apparently said about uh, the grandfathering. And um, certainly if a permit was required, it would be easier for us to catch. Uh -huh. But I'm not sure that the uh, ordinance itself says that you're allowed to just go ahead and change bulbs uh, out if, if your permit isn't, and then you wouldn't have to comply. I don't think that is, is correct. I, I can be corrected, but I think if you're changing out light fixtures, whether a permit is needed or not, you're supposed mm -hmm. to comply. Is that right? I would agree. I just think it's that's our enforcement mechanism is the, the fact you come in for a permit, but the, the code mm -hmm. applies to your regard. <coughs> All right, well, I certainly appreciate you um, answering all these questions because uh, some of these were re really important, especially to our business community. Um, and thank you, Nancy, for having those <laughs> answers for us. Um, at this point, if there's no more discussion, I will close the public hearing. And there are no more speaker cards that popped up? No, ma'am. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, let me find my spot. All right, I will close the public hearing. Consideration of Ordinance 16-03 as just presented. Any further council discussion? Mayor, if I may. Yes, Dennis. Thank you. Councilman. Uh, thank you, Dark Sky uh, folks, for coming in and clearing up the issues. I personally was on the fence, and uh, I think that I'm off the fence now. I think I have to agree with Councilman Leger, I think we're overthinking this. Uh, if, if we've got towns that are making it work and Fountain Hills is as good, if not a whole lot better than those towns, I feel like that we are a reasonable town. I feel like the staff is a reasonable staff and the folks that live in Fountain Hills will be reasonable with the ordinance. And if it does become a cumber, cumbersome problem, we can bring it back to the council. I mean, it's not a forever deal, but I, I see, I feel that it would be a real nice uh, plus to have that uh, title as a dark sky community. And again, I was totally on the fence when I walked into this room tonight. So thank you for your presentation. I'm sorry, I'm just a what if person. I like to get all my ducks in a I've row and I I've got all my answers now and I'm I'm, I'm happy vice mayor <laughs> thank you mayor I just wanted to uh, I'll just quickly echo uh, councilman Brown's statements I feel like I love this idea I think it's it's unique it adds character to what we're doing um, the density uh, and the municipal exemption don't really bother me that much I feel like that with the density one we could catch something like that early and Gosh, if Trader Joe's wanted to come, we could we can reopen negotiations and, and talk about turning in our certificate. Uh, I guess if, if that if that was the case, I wouldn't want to do it. But it's Trader Joe's. It's Trader Joe's. Um, so I mean, I, I do I do support this. It sounds like to get our our municipal needs accomplished, the school needs accomplished. Uh, I think this adds a lot of character to steal from uh, Mrs. Dombrowski's uh, comment. Um, but yeah, I, I support it too. I, I was on the fence as well today after hearing, doing my own research, but I, I, I appreciate what we heard today. And um, I think this would be a, a good, uh, valuable uh, addition to the community. Councilman Brown? Yeah, I, I did some quick math just for smiles. This room is approximately 2,400 square feet. And if you can get 90, 75 watt light bulbs in, uh, in an acre, we would have five in this room. And I thought that would be pretty, that would be like having five of these lights on. I, think, I wish you could shield these. We, <laughs> I can't even, that. we can't even look at them. Any other? Councilman Hanson. I think one of the reasons that some of us have come to the dark side 
is because of the work the committee has done and by everything they shared with us tonight to put concerns at ease. Mm -hmm. I just, Joe, I just had one question about the observatory. By supporting the dark skies, is, is there any kind of assumption with dark skies that the town in the future would be financially involved in a possible observatory? Okay. The, there's, the quick way to answer that is, first of all, we are not connected to the development of an observatory. Uh, the, but the possibility of be having this designation and an observatory would certainly help the observatory because if, if you start advertising as a town that we have a public observatory, that's one thing. But if you advertise that we have a public observatory in an officially designated dark sky community, that's going to attract people from throughout the valley. They're going to quit going to Gilbert and they're becoming to Fountain Hills instead. So um, it's a separate project entirely. Uh, we, you know, I personally support it, but um, it has nothing to do with that's, our committee's work. That's fine clarification. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is that the last question? Okay. Great. Great. Just, just a comment. Um, early on when we started working with the folks um, with the Dark Skies Committee, um, committee staff and I had a, a major concern about economic development because, as you know, that's a big, that's a big priority of the council. And one of the things that I've come to the conclusion after going through this and being better educated on, on dark skies is just like what we do if we were to land, say, a movie theater or if we were to land a, a Trader Joe's, basically we, through the development agreement process, could go ahead and you know, carve that out. So much like what we did for, for Park Place, there were some you know, town codes that we were able to go ahead and carve out. So that is a possibility that if we landed something great and we didn't want to have this cause an issue because the lighting package that they might have submitted was going to be far in excess of what uh, would be compliant with dark skies, we could always have as part of the development agreement a way of um, dealing with that, just like what we do at other developments. Okay, if we go into comments, Councilman Magazine. Let me just, for, <clears throat> let me just first say that, uh, and I know it's not directly connected, but an observatory may be the, the longest of long shots, but I sure hope people will continue to try to make it happen. I think it'd be fabulous for this community. Um, I'd like to offer a motion, um, and that is to move approval of Ordinance 16-03 uh, as presented with the following uh, amendments. Um, and let me just say that everybody on the day has, has this language, um, so I'm going to read it. It's section 8.04, Permanent and, tem and Temporary Exemptions. G, municipally owned lighting, one, and outdoor lighting owned by... All outdoor lighting owned by the town of Fountain Hills shall adhere to the following requirements. When new publicly owned buildings and other facilities are constructed or new public rights of way are established, the installation of new outdoor lighting fixtures shall be allowed only when, one, a specific need related to a hazardous nighttime situation is identified by the town, and two, lighting is deemed necessary as a matter of ensuring public safety, health, and welfare that is in the best interest of the town and the community. B, when existing publicly owned buildings, other facilities and public rights of way are modified by physical alterations and or by a change of use, the installation of new outdoor lighting fixtures beyond existing installations shall be allowed only when one, a specific need related to a hazardous nighttime situation is identified by the town and two, lighting is deemed necessary as a matter of ensuring public safety, health, and welfare that is in the best interest of the town and the community. C, with the establishment of any new subdivision development where street rights of way will be dedicated to the town, the town shall not allow the installation of street lights. However, in cases where it is determined that street lighting is deemed necessary in public rights of way for safety of pedestrians, bicyclists, and other motorists, the installation of street lighting shall be permitted. All lighting so installed shall be fully shielded, meet correlated color temperature requirements, make use of appropriate adaptive controls, and be subject to curfews as directed by the town council. And I so move. Second. Question on the motion. Could, that was so long. Um, <laughs> do you see any issue with, with some of that? I mean, that, that was really involved, especially the part about no street lights. 
Madam Mayor, members of council, as you know, it's it's all a matter of public policy whether or not you want to encourage street lights on your new streets. Um, public health, safety, and welfare is the standard by which you exercise your police power over anything. So that is uh, the the means by which you adopt your zoning ordinance and any other ordinances. So that standard is just the exemption is restating the standard that you all have in terms of your regulatory power. So I'm more comfortable with it if it includes that full set of the you know, health, safety, and welfare. Um, what I, I wanted to ask uh, Councilmember uh, Magazine on this one, though, is because we already referenced this in Section B, if the council adopts it with this amendment, is it acceptable to the council to just fix B rather than creating a new G? Oh, sure. Okay. Fine. Uh, as the maker of the motion, that's fine. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Are there questions on this? Does everybody understand this long motion or have any questions? Councilman Yates? It may be to Bob. The addition of the street um, caveat in this motion, was that necessary? We already have. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> That's the standard language that was, was provided by the Dark Sky uh, Group. Oh, I don't know whether it's necessary or not. I assume it is necessary for the compliance certificate. We didn't even discuss that. Okay. All right. Well, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <coughs> no? Okay. Um, does everybody understand everything that's in the motion? Yes? Yeah, I read the packet. Okay. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Any opposed? Nick. <laughs> Mayor 7 0. Congratu congratulations. Okay. Job well done. I'm calling Trader Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we don't have anything as far as direction to staff. We do have some. Activities. It's been very busy, so don't go anywhere. We've got a few different things to, that we want to talk about. Um, the first is uh, homecoming parade. What's better for a hometown than a good old-fashioned homecoming parade? And um, Councilman Yates wanted to talk about that. Oh, just want to say, uh, Councilman Lejeune, I had a hoot uh, in the back of a what was it a Mustang? Um, new route. Um, it was a lot of fun, well attended, uh, a lot of potential there, and, and Councilman Leger had some wonderful ideas on how to kind of uh, create some more hype on it because then all the activities end at the high school, and I thought that was really neat the way they did this. But I, I see this as something we can grow on. And Madam Mayor, you, yourself and Senator Kavanaugh were, were there as well. Also. Nobody the, fell off no the back. No one fell off the back, and no one got hit by any candy, so I think that was <laughs> tremendous. Okay, um, Make a Difference Day uh, it was a huge success. My Mayor's Youth Council did a landscaping project. The students and adult helpers, including Senator Kavanaugh, did a great job. Um, I want to thank the staff. Uh, lots of staff participated on that day, giving up their own free time. And of course, he headed up by Heather Ware, who does an, an awesome job. So I know Vice Mayor DePorter wanted to talk about his project. Sure. Um, my son, my five-year-old son and I led a team with the Target, uh, some Target employees and some uh, high school students who needed community service hours, not, <laughs> not judge ordered, but just <laughs> academically or ordered. Uh, it was a fantastic project. We painted a house. I got there just in time as the, the boys from the high school team started painting the wrong side of the house with the wrong color, so we were able to fix that quickly before the nice lady came outside. But I, I wrote Heather today just for some stats. Um, so Heather wrote me, I'm going to read this verbatim because she's awesome. There were 44 projects, 350 volunteers, 62 residents served, seven wheelchair ramps were made, landscaping, painting, filling holes in walls, changing out batteries and smoke alarms, patching garage doors, carpets were cleaned, windows were washed, kitchens and bathrooms were given a deep cleaning. Many, many residents have written letters of thanks and appreciation for the kindness, and they all mention how fortunate they feel to live in our community that cares about them, helping neighbor to neighbor. It was really cool. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And a dark Yay. sky. Do you 
Thank you, thank you to Heather. You had a project. Oh, that, Come on. that was. Uh, your, yours I was, a, was. I was one of the landscapers, and I brought my. Uh, <laughs> this was really interesting. My, mine was interesting because my my son, especially my son, is very politically active at such a young age and has embraced the election season, believe it or not. And um, regardless of what, where you see me, left or right, um, the 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 team that I led was complete polar opposite of where we were politically. But we had a lot of fun, and it was all about community, and we got along great. But my son was periodically would put his hoe down and start getting into a debate with, with some of the Typical. folks. But it, it was a hoot, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we got a lot done. It was good. Okay, so a couple other things I want to mention. Um, I did take part in SRP's all-day water education program. It's a great program that every elected official really should take uh, when it becomes available again. <coughs> Complete education about water in the valley and some great tips that I got from uh, an expert of theirs on some things that we could do for our own lake to clean up our lake. And they've also offered advice free of charge. Uh, I think everybody saw Channel 10. They came to visit Fountain Hills and um, they were out on the plaza. They started out baking cookies out there with Corey McCluskey. And it was really an off awesome exposure for the town. Um, Andrea Robinson, Troy Hayden, of course, they're the big stars, and they were out there. And it was funny because I was in um, I was in Mesa, and a guy just no, I was in Tempe, and a guy just comes up to me and he says, "I know you," and I says, "How do you know me?" He says, "I saw you on Channel 10." So, and then he said, "Oh, what a beautiful town you have!" So this was really great exposure for Fountain Hills. Um, we had the groundbreaking on the community garden last weekend. Dr. Jody Patel, who spearheaded the project along with FHCCA President Jenny Willigrod were there with some of the big sponsors, Bart Shea of NSHE Group and EPCOR, a water company. Um, they wanted me to say that uh, if anybody's interested in reserving a garden bed for yourself, information is on the garden Facebook page. Um, um, I was did some really fun fun uh, morning. I was invited to the third grade at McDowell Mountain School to talk about our town government. It was fun and I got to meet their class president and their class council member. And one other bit of tourism I did, I was on live streaming interview at Copperwind during the tournament uh, tennis match that was going on. Of course I got to talk about our beautiful town and that streaming went international. So we're getting some fabulous Publicity here in town. Everybody knows okay. where we are. Is Councilman Hanson. There's some Hansen. confusion on the ribbon cutting for the community garden. I heard the resident that expressed concern that they got here early, but they were too late for the ribbon cutting. And I just and they expressed, you know, in the future that they would hope that you know things were maybe communicated. So I was just curious, yeah. you know, if they're listening tonight, maybe clarification on. Yeah. How, why the timing changed? I think we kind of found out about it at the last minute, too, because Grady was on vacation, and possibly they could have postponed it so that Grady could have been there. And I know even Barche had another commitment, so he didn't make it to Is the ribbon cutting. Is that why it started cutting. early, though? But it, that was the group that set it up. You know, I was just told to be there at that time, and so we didn't have any control, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't chamber-related either. So, you know, I just hope they'll still stay involved. Yeah, I'm sure they will. There's so much stuff going on. Um, yeah. Just want to remind everybody, uh, Cassie, please pass us. We have the ribbon cutting for the musical um, park this Saturday morning, and then right yeah. after that is a ribbon cutting for the new tunnel, and right after that is a ribbon cutting for the new tennis court. That's right. So there's a lot going on. And you know, I didn't even mention Halloween in the Hills. What a fabulous oh, yeah, that. night that <laughs> was. It was like 35 boots and boy, people came from everywhere. We must have had like 75 entries for kids and the pets and you know, so like a big shout out to Stephanie and Sammy Fine Jewelry that puts that together every single year. It's wonderful, another great publicity for our town. So thank you to Stephanie. Wow, we could just keep going. We've been so busy, huh? Can the I? Dogs have to go out, so. <laughs> All right, let the dogs out. Uh huh. Motion to close. Okay, good. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Right. Let me get pause. Thank you, audience, for hanging in with us. We had an audience today. <laughs>